Now we do Rashi. Yeah, I just saw a beautiful teaching from Rabbi Elimelech on the first Rashi on the Parsha, so we always have to share from Rabbi Elimelech, right? So this week's Parsha is Parsha's Emor. Hayomer Hashem Moshe, God said to Moshe, Emor Kohanim B'nai Aaron, say to the Kohanim, the children of Aaron, Amart am and speak to them, to a soul, you cannot become Tamei amongst his people. So this is the commandment for a Kohen, that a person who's a Kohen, uh, God said to Moshe to tell Aaron to say to the Kohanim, to, to say to the Kohanim, sons of Aaron, say to them that you're not going to become Tamei for a Nefesh. What does that mean? That if you're a Kohen, you can't come in contact with a dead body. If he's a Jew, you can't be in the same room with, if you're a Kohen, you can't be in the same room with a, or same building, depending on, on the contours with a with a dead Jewish body. And I'm just giving you the straight law that if it's a non-Jew, you know, be in this, the Kohen could be in the same building, but he can't touch the dead body. So so the, non, the Kohen cannot become Tamei, cannot become Tamei. So can a Kohen go to the cemetery? So the Kohen is allowed to go to the funeral only of his seven close relatives, the mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, and wife, his unmarried sister, mother, father, wife, son, daughter, and unmarried sister, and brother. But... It doesn't say wife here. He can. He'll say. Okay, uh, so the um, so the um, the shero usually refers to his wife. So so Rashi says that in shero el ishto that when it says his relative it means his wife. So he can go only to their funeral, but he can't do anything else. But in terms of a funeral, a lot of the cemeteries in Israel are very sensitive about this. That they have, if it's outdoors, as long as you're not within six feet. And there's no tree over you, which could create like a kind of tent-like structure where you're in the same building. Then the coin could go. So a lot of funerals, cemeteries in Israel have what's called a derach kohanim, a way where it's kosher for the coin to be able to attend the service. So the koha, so in Israel they have that, but in the um, um, in America it's it's often more complicated. America it's often more complicated. So it's only to those seven closest relatives. So oh. Gentile cemetery. Oh, so it's gentile. So if it's gentile, then you're allowed to be in the same uh, building with the gentile as long as you don't touch a body. So to go to a gentile cemetery will be okay, but it becomes problematic. Like let's say you want to go to. We, I remember one year they took the kids from the school to the. Uh, he took them from Berman on a class trip to Gettysburg. And then the uh, post sake for the school ruled that all the Kohanim had to stay on the bus. Mm. So the kids drove there and then they had to stay on the bus. And so that was a big mess because he, they were concerned that there were many Jewish soldiers who died on both sides of the war. And so therefore they would be concerned that they'd be walking over their mm. graves so they wouldn't let the kids go out. So even though it was many years ago, their bones are, the bone, most of the bones turned to to dust, but if there's enough dust, it's considered a bone also. So you can't. So so yeah. Don't touch. Or I mean, like you say, it could be the dust that. Right. Even if you stay away. Yeah. You don't touch the kohen is still can. But... So the kohen is not allowed to be o over it. Uh, if it's a Jewish body, you can't be over it like what's called an ol a tent. You can't be in the same tent. You know, like structure. So. Yeah, you have to be concerned about going to to Cohen has to be very careful. Cohen has to be very careful. So we'll look and we'll see. We'll see another unusual aspect of this law. And more al Kohanim. So Rashi says so, so first of all, another highly unusual is what Rash is going to talk about right here at the be very beginning. It's the first Rashi tells us. Say to the Kohanim and then say to them. So we have a double expression of the word say. And moral Kohanim b'nei Aaron v'amartal I am. Say to the Kohanim and say to them. So Rashi tells us, Vazhir Gedolim Rashi says this is to 
warn the adults about the minors. Meaning to say, why does it say say twice? So that 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 there is this even typically speaking, the laws don't apply until your bar mitzvah. Until your bar mitzvah, you don't have to observe the laws. But here we're commanded not to allow even a minor coin to uh, become in contact with a dead body. So let's say there is even like little children, this happens, let's say there's little, let's say a synagogue will often have a, um, a nursery in it, right? Uh, and so then different parts of the building and then the uh, synagogue sometimes has funerals in it. So then the uh, funeral, so if you bring in a, the aron, the, the coffin, into the funeral, into the into the synagogue, and there are children in the nursery, little two year old pushers, right? Excuse my French, <laughs> and they uh, are kohanim. They have to leave. So because it says right here, the kohan, you have to. You're warning about the minors, even in this case. It's unusual law. Unusual. Normally, you can take the little kid, and you don't care what they do if they're under a certain age. It's not going to be a concern. But here, no matter what age, you have to be careful about it. Uh, guy, yes, you had a question. Yeah. Well, the, how does it apply in cases of war and humanitarian mm -hmm. uh, cases? So the answer is obviously when you're in war, you know we we, we dispense with a lot of laws because we're in a situation of of uh, uh, life is in danger, and in war we don't we we are much more lean to many areas, you know. So we. We we have a lot of dispensations when it comes to war. But even there, it's not always a dispensation. A Kohen has different aspects of the law. Uh, but obviously, if they're on a humanitarian mission, if they're trying to save lives, we're, we're more lean. The problem is not when you're in the moment. The problem is the training for that. So that became a very big question. How can a Kohen ever become a doctor? Because also when you went in order to train to be a doctor, right. you have to touch a dead body, you have to work with a dead body. So there you can't say, oh, well, it's life is in danger because there's no life in danger. You're just a student at that point and you're learning. Yeah, but only future life will be in danger. Yeah, but we don't say that typically. And also, you you don't know that this person, that this doctor, that this guy who's in medical school is going to certainly go into you know, like an uh, emergency room doctor, they could end up being an eye doctor, you know, like their life or is not in danger, or a pathologist and just working on, you know. So that's the waiver of that? So, so again, here it's, it's very, it's a big problem because um, it's a big problem. So some wanted to argue that Kohanim should not be doctors, but Rabbi Gorin, who was, I think, the chief rabbi of the army at that time in Israel, came up with a very controversial ruling, very, very controversial ruling. And and uh, I'm saying it now, with, I'm saying I might not get exactly right, but he transferred, he said, if you touch the coin you, to uh, the dead body, and then you hold the coin, and then, so basically it's like, yeah, he, he know that you. He came up with a theory with a coin, and and thereby limiting the uh, the tumma from the dead body because you're saying you're getting it from from the coin and not the dead body. But the problem is, many people just laughed at that. They didn't. A lot of people didn't take it seriously, so it became a big question. Yeah, Rabbi Yosef. I was just gonna say that my brother looked into it because he's an ambulance driver volunteer, and and. Uh, he found out that there is a program, I think, in Mexico or somewhere else in South America, where they teach you uh, virtually that you don't actually have to touch the body for anatomy. And and then his rabbi said, but who would want to go to a doctor that never actually trained on a body? So <laughs> <laughs> that was a very, a very yeah, good so, explanation. Uh, you know, that's, that's the reality. The reality is that there's a lot of things that are virtual, but, you, you know, you could do what's called telehealth today. But the doctors will tell you, I know my wife says, you know, you can't compare, even though some things you could do it, but most things the doctor has to touch. Mm -hmm. And so, 
anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked, but that's the commandment. But about this idea, Rebelli Melch takes it to another level. He says it's like this. What does Rebbe Yoli Melech say? He says, literally means to warn the Gedolim about the great, about the small. What does that mean? He says it like this, that who are the Gedolim? Gedolim are tzaddikim. Tzaddikim, to warn the tzaddik even about the smallest infraction. Let's say you have an all white, beautiful suit, you know, like your your uh, Memorial Day suit. You pull it out, uh, and you pull out your Memorial Day suit, and it's spotless. And then somebody drops just a little drop of of uh, ketchup, oh, you know, just a little drop of ketchup right in the center of your suit. That's a very small drop. It ruins the whole suit. Of course, the whole thing is ruined. It's just one little drop. But if you have if you have a uh, a grungy suit and then you drop a little red drop on it, nobody will care. Might even nobody will notice. So, or let's say you have a beautiful BMW and you get a little dent in it, and all of a sudden everybody's upset. But if you have a, like a schlocky car, you don't even know which dent you did on it, right? So the the idea is that the tzaddik. He has to be careful not even to do even a small minor sin because even the small minor sin of the tzaddik will be uh, will, will look enormous. Will look enormous. Uh, so therefore, that's what Billy Mel says is to warn the gedolim, warn the great ones, not even to do uh, the smallest infraction because it will be uh, it will be from the perspective of the of the tzaddik, it'll be a huge huge infraction. That's why sometimes you see like somebody. Oh, what did he do? What's the big deal? You know, I remember like when uh, there was a senator for many years in Congress, uh, his name Ted Stevens. And he was the, probably the most powerful senator for many years. He was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And you know how they brought him down? They brought him down on a rocking chair. He said he got a rocking chair as a gift and he didn't report it as taxes. A rocking chair, a, a $1,000 chair. So the point is, I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with it. What? He's the last. Yeah. I'm not saying that you don't have to. I'm just saying that probably 99% of the people in the country, if they did such an infraction, nobody would care. But this man was convicted in the federal court on the on the concern of not reporting a rocking chair. Yeah. That's what they got him on. The, look it up. He got him on a chair. Yeah. Okay. They got him on a chair. On a, a little chair. But that's the thing, that the bigger you are, the more careful you have to be concerned about an infraction. That's like Justice Thomas. Uh, oh. Justice Thomas. I don't know what's going on there. Oh. Oh. Tens of thousands of dollars. Yes. But if you're a judge, you're above the law, so that's that. Okay, so then we say, B'nai Aaron, the sons of Aaron. Okay, so now we have the next Rashi. Say to the Kohanim, who are the sons of Aaron, Yocho Chalolim, I might think, it applies also that you're not allowed to come into contact with a dead body. Also applies to chalolim. Who are chalolim? So chalolim are the children who are born from marriages that the Kohen or unions that the Kohen was specifically forbidden against. So let's say the Kohen is not allowed to be with a non-Jewish woman or, or a divorcee and and he or um, or a woman who was already divorced and he has a uh, offspring that offspring is no longer a coin oh. so even though for example you might have the coin gene and your father is a coin and you know your grandfather's a coin it's very possible that you're not a coin if your father married a person or was with a woman he wasn't supposed to and your mother was forbidden to be with the coin and you're the offspring of that union then you're not a Kohen, you're called a Halal. Called a Halal. Actually, Israel, when I was a member for associate member, they want you to certify that there's nobody in your descendant you know, line and that was divorced and you know, I can get. So in 1880, my great grandfather was divorced. So they said to uh, the Russian folks, Do you have a get from 1880? Fortunately, uh, the rabbi at the time said, Well, we don't enforce because uh, I don't have a get. You can't be assured 
the divorce was um, uh, because of the couldn't have children after five or ten years. Anyway, so it's a real problem. And so unfortunately, rabbis today don't enforce that strictly. I mean, there it is an issue. Like, where'd you get the divorces in America all the time? But then again, how do you know that they were married? So the same way you don't know the divorce, you don't know that they were really married. So, so yeah. So then it says B'nai Aron. Yes, guy. Can like Kohenim or I don't know Levi like be transmitted through like adoption? No, Kohen is it's a Kohen and a Levi. The only way they're transmitted is through the father. If the father is a Kohen or if the father is a Levi, then the male offspring is going to be a Kohen or a Levi. Not through the mother, not through adopted. So that's a very strict rule. And then I tell God. It's so genetic. It's genetic. The it's genetic. Still, you know, so the, the, the God went to the rabbi and said, this I was become a Kohen. I would make a donation, $100,000 to the show. Yeah. And I'm saying, I'll do it. Uh, half a million. A million. I'll give you everything I own. $10 million dollars to become a Kohen. Finally, the rabbi said, but well, why is it so important to you? He said, well, my father was a Kohen. His father was a Kohen. <laughs> so that's a joke, because there really was a Kohen, but it's just no. Right. My mom is a boss lady. Her dad is a lady, but I'm not. It's because it's just my mom. Right. So they have, they have certain, you have certain rules you get, benefits, certain benefits if the mother is a daughter of a Kohen, daughter of a Levi, now you don't do a page on a bend, uh, but but that's the rule. The actual kahuna and the levi is only transmitted through the father um, biologically, the biological father genetically to the offspring. And then it states, B'nai Aaron, Rashi says, af bale mumin b'mashma. This also, even those who are blemished are also implied, meaning to say, so what this means is there are certain Kohanim who have a blemish. What's a blemish? This is a disqualifying, um, this disqualifies you from serving in the temple because you have something which is a physical, um, today we wouldn't speak this type of language because we're very sensitive to, to uh, disabilities, but let's say you have some kind of physical uh, was variation from the norm, deviation from the norm, excuse my language if I'm not using the most uh, sensitive language, and that would disqualify you from service in the kahuna. That's called a bal mum. That's called that you have a blemish. But if you have such a blemish, even though you can't serve in the temple, you're still disqualified. You're still a coin and you cannot come in contact with the dead body. So yes, uh, Rabbi Kiva, Wait, so what's the thing if, like, a Kohen has, like, a bruise or like, right. something on their hand, but they can't do the blessing? So there, those types of activities also prevent the Kohen from doing the Birka Kohanim. Is that just a cut? Because it's not really a disability if he just has, like, let's say a gap. So the Torah lists the blemishes, and uh, you have to go into the exact cause, but any permanent blemish, there are certain ones that disqualify. It becomes... Very, it becomes a very sensitive question because there are people who've been doing the Birkas Kohanim their whole life, and then all of a sudden they get, they are in a wheelchair. Obviously, it's very traumatic in its own part to end up in a wheelchair. And then the uh, I'm not saying that there are no leniencies, but the standard normative ruling is that Kohanim in wheelchairs can't give the Birkas Kohanim, and that could be absolutely devastating if you're a Kohen to learn this. So there are some, there are some rabbis who work very hard to find leniencies because of the just incredible emotional distress of such kohanim that they take get so much pleasure out of the birkas kohanim and but it's a it's not a simple question at all and this and the overwhelming majority of rabbis say that you can't give the birkas kohanim under those circumstances. Yeah, that's just an example. Just an example. What if it's temporary? Like, what's it like yeah. sprain their foot? So temporary, I, okay, I'm not an expert on these laws, but I believe temporary is not an issue, or maybe you have to just wait for it to be healed. But uh, but these are serious questions that you need to be holding in it. Uh, another question is, can you give the Birkas Kohanim when you're an Avel, when you're a mourner? 
Uh, many people say you can't uh, say you should just, but the problem is you can't be in the room when you're called. You can't be called to give the bear cause call on him and then not give it because that's a prohibition. Like let's say somebody would show up to our yeshiva and all of a sudden we say call on him and the guy's like, well, no, I'm not in Israel. I'm not doing it. I'm going to, I just want to, I'm doing my practice. My practice is I only give the bear cause call on him when I'm in Israel. Uh, or when it's Yontif. And now all of a sudden the rabbi here says you should do it. And the guy's like, no, I don't want to do it. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to do it. If your custom is you don't want to do it, that's okay. But but you have to leave the room because if you're called to do it and you don't do it, then you're violating, you're violating the Torah because the Torah says that you have to bless when you're called. So then it's a violation and then it's a big problem. So if there's some Kohanim who don't want to... Uh, whatever reason they're not comfortable, I always tell them, then just, just don't be in the room because that's a big problem. That's a big problem. Was, isn't it also true that if, even if you're an Avel, if you're the only Kohen, you can still give so, Kohen? So you got an Avel, right. So an Avel, there's, there's a, it's, I said it's a question. Some say you can't, some say you can, some say it depends. So, you know, in Israel, the Kohanim or Avelim do it. Just in America, it's like, it's, it's very rare. It's very rare in America that you do the Birkas Khanim. You only do it on Yantif, usually, except for here. So it's a different issue. The Reverend Franco said in America, do it for every day. Yeah, well, yeah, Rabbi Shan, we do it here every day because it's, uh, first of all, to me, it's uh, my favorite part of the davening that we do it here. Whenever we get to going here, it's just very uplifting, focused. And it's an opportunity to come closer to Hashem. And yeah, I looked into it very, very carefully. You had a, a lot of many, different rabbis all encouraged me to do it. So I'm like, I believe I was with you the first time it ever happened with Aaron Arlott. Yeah, he just jumped up and did it. But that, that was the first time. You know, when, when I was a rabbi of a shul, I felt like in a shul, in a shul, your responsibility is to cast a very wide net, to be as accommodating to a lot of different places and also to adopt a long-standing practice of the shul and only change it when it's, um, only change it under, it shouldn't be the default to change the practice of a shul. When you start a yeshiva, then you just, you're in a different setting. You're not, for you're in the context of a yeshiva and you have more latitude to do basically the, the practice of the rabbi and the ruling of the rabbi. Uh, on the halachic ruling of the rabbi. And so I feel that certain things are not appropriate for a shul, but they're more appropriate for a yeshiva, uh, a yeshiva context. There were many rabbis uh, from Israel, great rabbis, who when they came from Israel to America, for whatever reason, they would come on a trip, they made sure to daven in a Sephardic minion. And the reason is because the Sephardim do the Birka Kohanim every day. Mm -hmm. And these rabbis were had the practice of doing the Birka Kohanim in Israel, and they wanted to continue that practice. Mm -hmm. Of course, the most classic ruling, the most classic story about this is the story of the Vilna Gon. That there's really no good reason why we don't, why outside of Israel you don't give a Birka Kohanim every day. So the Vilna Gon gave a ruling that in the Shul in Vilna, they should do the Birka Kohanim. He said, well, you should start doing the Birkos Kohanim tomorrow. And then the story, the legend is that that night, the shul burnt down, so they took it as a sign, don't do it. <laughs> Very dramatic. Yes, Mordechai. The restriction was if, if, if you have a blemish, because the, if, if the person had a surgical scar that was visible outside of his clothing, you know, would that be considered a blemish, or would that be considered uh, permissible? I, I so I don't want to answer these questions because I'm not an expert, and I'd have to look it up. Each one uh, is not the type of questions I usually am um, um, current in, so you have to look at them. But there's a lot of questions about it. Let's say people, um, people who are, you know, somebody who's killed somebody is also not allowed to do the Birkas Kohanim. So let's say. It was after the Holocaust. Somebody killed somebody. About the accident. Uh, yeah. Accident. So these are these Still. are real. These are real. I'm not. I'm not giving any definitive answers here because again, I'm not holding because people don't typically ask me these questions, so I'm not current on it. But it's a problem. All these things are are problematic, and people have to be careful about it. So. Are.
idiot, you'll find blemishes for uh, disqualification. I have Jewish priesthood, so you can hold it. I trust Rabbi No, 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 no. But what I do think is an incredible source, what I do think is an incredible source is Halachapedia. Do you know about Halachapedia? Yeah. H A L A C H I P E D I A. Halachapedia is just an incredible resource. Yeah. Who put together Halachapedia? I believe it's like the same people who put together Wikipedia. Everybody's doing it. You know, it's good. It's, I mean, like who, who started it? It wasn't just, you know. Missed, I don't know. Look it up on Wikipedia who started.